You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott Hambrick. Over there is Matt Reynolds. It's day 738 of the pandemic. Uh, I just got in from with, I was out on the, in, the, in the shop with Charity grinding corn for cornmeal. I hope everything's all right with you guys. Uh, the kids are pedaling the bicycle generator right now so that the uh, laptop and the uh, uh, camera and the recording equipment will work. So uh, hopefully they're going to have enough energy to get through this. <sighs> How are good. things there in Missouri? We're doing all right. We're hanging in there. Uh, Rachel and I, I, I never talk about this. Rachel and I had our first legit argument since COVID started two nights ago. Like, a, you know, like a, like a good enough argument. That's not argument. bad. You know, went over 700 days without an argument. <laughs> it's a long time. COVID uh, and we, you know, remedied it by the end of the night. And, you know, we didn't let the sun, well, the sun was down, but we didn't go to sleep mm-hmm. on, uh, on any drama. Did you, did you guys, did you guys, you know, make up? Um, that's a little too, per- I mean, if I did, I would have said so, but okay. there were there were um, bi- biological and evolutionary reasons why we couldn't really make up, and hmm. so um, yeah, so, and I'll leave it at that. So, uh, but it went fine. So we're fine, and we I don't know about you and Charity. Rachel and I argue about one thing and one thing only, and that's the children hmm. or discipline thereof. So uh, anyway, all was good, and uh, no, we're doing we're doing great. Hey, listen. So I think I have dropped some hints about this on the podcast. Uh, you know, the podcast, our listeners know, uh, this podcast ain't free. And one of the things I love about the podcast, you think about most podcasts, mo- most podcasts are either just turn on the recorder and just like start recording and never cut anything and you get some boring times and Lord knows what Hambrick might say. And then you've got the other end of the spectrum, which is the highly produced, right? NPR, Serial, Wondery, you know, that kind of stuff. Incredibly expensive sort of podcast. I love it because we're kind of in the middle. We've got producer Trent. He's fantastic. Producer Trent ain't free and he ain't cheap, but he's worth it what we pay him. And so we have been doing some advertising on this podcast for the last couple of years or so. And I get it that everybody would rather have podcasts without advertising, but it's nice to be able to pay our people who do podcasts and for the podcast to pay for itself. So we are very careful about who we bring on on this podcast to advertise. We love people like Dominion Strength, the best belts in the country, and micro gains and those guys that are been our friends for years. <sighs> Hambrick, I don't know if I've ever been more excited about who the sponsor of the podcast is right now. I don't even know who it is. It's Tushy Bidets. We have a company that makes beautiful butthole washes sponsoring our podcast. I, I, I'm almost going to get emotional about this. I have not used toilet paper my entire life. I use baby wipes for the first 35 years of my life. And a few years ago, I converted over to Tushy Bidets, and it's the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me. And they are the sponsor for the podcast now. Well, I, uh, I buy leather scraps from Dominion and use that. Well, I, I can see how that might work. You know, especially if they've been worked a little bit. Uh, you know, they're not quite as rough. You don't want the rough stuff, right? I'm like, give me that, give me that, like, Three eighths vegetan leather. <laughs> I use it more so, like a putty knife. I don't really. What I've been holding off on this Tushy thing because Tushy sponsored the podcast about six weeks ago, but I couldn't run an ad because I don't know if you've heard, but there's this pandemic called COVID and the world ran out of toilet paper. And so the world turned to bidets and Tushy essentially did in one day what they had done in about six months of 2019. Right. That's how my, and they immediately sold out and everything was on back order. So I can't run an ad for, for tushies. Now, listen here, folks. Number <laughs> one, if you want a bidet, these bidets are fantastic. I'm, I'm going to send you one, Scott, and I want to, I want a field report. Okay. Hmm. This is important. Okay. There is something magical about these bidets. I don't understand how every time I sit on this bidet and turn on the nozzle, it, it is a perfect bullseye directly into my sphincter. It's because it's so large. My sphincter is not that large. You've seen pictures of it. 
I, I remember uh, that. The, your, listen. listen, your adjective for my sphincter was that's pristine. But, you called my sphincter pristine. Listen, and you know why? Because I use Tushy Bidase. But here's what I need you to do. I need you to tape a quarter right next to it. Take another picture and send that to me so I'll have that for scale. It's way smaller than a quarter. Not even close. Okay. Now, listen, people. This is the most important part of this whole thing. Do not, under any circumstances, go to tushy.com. That is not the website you want. That is a website that's going to get you fired or divorced. Hmm. I got on it on tushy.com on an airplane a few weeks ago when they signed up. And the people all around me saw what I pulled up. The website, in fact... <laughs> this is lurid. I went. <laughs> is, is hellotushy.com. Hellotushy.com backslash logic. And that saves you a bunch of money off a bidet that's already cheap. They're like, I don't know, they're like 70-something dollars for a bidet. And here's the thing. They attach right on your toilet you already have. I get it. Here's my thoughts about bidets earlier. French people have these things that are like toilets, and then next to them, three feet away, is a bidet. And I'm like, how do they get from the first one to the second one without, you know, without leaving a trail? Tushy bidets mount underneath your seat. It takes about two minutes to, to plug them into your toilet. And you don't need toilet paper anymore other than two squares for a little drying blot at the end. That's all you need. With perfect laser beam-like precision, Tushy bidets will clean your butthole to percent. You can, you can eat off of it if you need to. Just... As a, you know, you probably don't. Probably you don't. Probably don't. Yeah. And if you buy now, they'll send you a free chamois. A chamois. I also think Ma you can maybe go to the main won't. website and use discount code logic. You could try that as well. But let's just go ahead and overrun these people <laughs> with hellotushy.com slash logic and, and get yourself a nice bidet. And again, please stay away from tushy.com. Yeah. That is not, that is not the website we want to go to. Can confirm. Uh, so I love tushies. Yes, thanks for sponsoring the podcast. Uh, I love it. I love it. Let's, it's let me tell you the one. Let me can I be honest about a, a legit review. Let me tell you about the one downside of a tushy bidet. When you travel and you go to a hotel and you have to use the scratchy toilet paper, your bottom is no longer adapted to that, and so it can become a little bit of a problem. So so tushy, listen to me. I need you to develop a travel version of this that I can keep in my backpack. You, you can put, put it next on. to your CPAP when you travel. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. Ridiculous. That's right. And I need to be able to hook that up to a hotel toilet so that I don't, um, because it, the, yeah, the just the use a water pick. Not, huh? Just use a water pick. I, you know, I've thought about that. That's actually not a bad idea. Well, I know this is pick. a dream come true for you because when we started this thing in uh, July of 2017, you're like, man, I wish that they could get them as a, as a podcast uh, sponsor. And that's true. You know, listen, reach for the stars, and you just might We've catch him, Matt, Matt Reynolds. We've arrived. Carl says, old okay. beginner. This is Old not a, beginner. Yeah, that's the subject. This is not our Carl. This is another Carl. He says, I'm a 60-year-old, right. untrained, unathletic beginner. I'm five foot nine, 195 pounds, and a big fan of groceries. I've read all the books, and after messing around with weights and machines for about a year at the local Y, I'm several weeks into LP, and I made nice progress on the lower body lifts. I squatted 225 for three by five. 295 pull for five. He says, my problem is I'm embarrassingly weak in the upper body. I struggled to finish my bench, bench press this morning with 130 for three by five. I feel like I'm near the end of LP. And during my last session, I failed my third set of five presses at 80. I don't have any injuries or pain while lifting. And my range of motion isn't great. I don't think it is hindering me. What should I do? <sighs> This is really common, right? It happens all the time. It's really common. It happens all the time in these 60-year-olds. Especially for this exact demographic, a demographic who has not... We, we get the gym bro demographic, and their upper body is so far advanced of their lower body that their lower body is playing... Like, they, they bench press more than they squat yep. for a long time. This demographic, the older demographic who hasn't done this in a, a very long time or ever will find that they can, their squats and their deadlifts make massive progress. And because of, honestly, because of probably some sarcopenia, some lot, some muscle wasting as they start getting older, um, and probably lower testosterone as well. We see this in every woman we have, every yep. female. Their upper body is just can't stay caught up. And so there are a couple things you can do. One thing you need to understand is if you run out of LP and upper body, it doesn't mean that you're out of LP and you're no longer a novice. You can keep running LP, 
on the lower body stuff, and you should, but you might have to make some changes to the upper body programming in order to get the correct balance of stress to keep driving progress. As a side note, and I'm sure you, you'll com comment as well on this stuff, is you should get your testosterone checked. Because the first thing that I see when I think about when somebody's like, boy, my lower body's strong and my upper body is weak, I go, mm, I'd like to see a test reading to see what's going on. Yeah, it's commonly accepted knowledge, I, I believe, that there are more androgen receptors in the upper body than the lower body. Yep. And we know that because you look at guys and ladies, um, they make more testosterone, there are all those receptors up there, by golly, they receive, and then they get lots of muscle in the upper body versus the ladies. And so, so the, my older guys, they got pretty good squat and deadlift numbers like you have. I almost always think uh, that they need to have their testosterone checked. Yeah. It's probably not abysmally low. Uh, you know, if you're not a pear shaped guy, if you're sleeping okay, but it could, it, it could be low. Go, go, go have her checked out. It'll help your recovery and um, make those, make those things move. It's never been easier to do that. That's the other thing. It's never been. Remember how hard it was to get your testosterone check like 15 years ago? I bet it's horrible right now in the middle of this well, the, okay. the pandemic. Listen, but you, I hear what you're saying. Nobody testosterone check today. But when yeah. they start to open stuff up again, it won't be an issue. And part of that is because there's so many private labs now. So you can just go to your doctor and ask. Most, Almost all of our listeners are going to have health insurance. They can get that thing done. But if you don't want anybody to know and you want to keep some privacy, you can go to you can go to LabCorp or Quest, you know, one of those. We don't have any relationship with, I mean, we don't, you know, we certainly don't make money off of them. And you can pay a little bit more money out of pocket and get that stuff done. And it's still pretty cheap. It's not like what it was 15 years ago and get that, get that test done. Yeah. And if those numbers come back, okay. And well, even if they don't, you're going to have to do more volume and you're going to yep. have to do, you're going to have to do stuff like barbell rows and you're going to do chins. He reckon he, uh, he mentions that he can do about a, a chin and a half. And no dips, but he can do 15 push-ups. Yeah, do those push-ups to get some more volume. Train that chin. You know, you know, do some assisted work there. Train those dips. Assisted work with those. But tips are great for the hypertrophy, I think. I love I think those. So, uh, so no matter what, you're going to have to do more work. Make sure you eat your protein, too, Carl. Let us know how it's going. Yes. Uh, let's see here. Sorry, my com computer is uh, beeping here. Oh my gosh. Google just signed me out of our Gmail account. Just That's signed okay. me out. I'm getting back in here. <laughs> okay. I got a I got a story for you. I've been holding back for like two weeks that I got I'll tell you between questions here. So I woke up last well Thurs Thursday night, actually a week ago today. Our internet went out about three thirty in the afternoon. It's almost exactly a week ago. And occasionally our internet goes out and of course my first thought was you know, it'd be real, like, we've done pretty well with this whole COVID thing, like in business, running online business and stuff. If the internet goes down or the power grid goes down, we're in trouble, obviously. And so, of course, the first thing, I'm like, oh, God, the internet's down. Is it down everywhere? It's not. It's down here. I get up Friday morning. I've got an important business call I need to have Friday morning. Internet's still down. Mediacom is who I have. You've heard of Mediacom? One of the big, you know. Nope. What a, what a stupid name. Mediacom. Well, and like Comcast and places like that. Okay, so I have been a client of Mediacom for 20 years. It is the cable, TV, and internet provider in Southwest Missouri. There isn't anything else, right? There is some AT&T stuff, but I have gigabit internet, and this is, this is it. If you want anything fast, you got to do Mediacom. I have, uh, so I call, actually, first I text. They've got like a texting service where you can text customer service. And I, so I text them and the guy's like, uh, you know, we don't have any record of you ever having an account here. I've had an account there for 20 years. And so I'm like, man, I've had an account here for 20 years. It auto texts back. Your conversation with Cody is over. <laughs> okay. So I call customer service, wait on hold, wait on hold, wait on hold. Lady finally answers the phone. I'm like, hey, I, internet's down. I got gigabit internet. Not sure what's going on. Can we reset the modem? What do we got to do? And uh, she took her a while to find my to find my <laughs> to find my account, and she's like, "Oh, it's been uh, internet's been cut off for non-payment." I was like, "What?" And she's mm -hmm. like, "Yeah, we cut it off because she didn't pay your bill." <laughs> now, hopefully, our listeners have been listening long enough to know this is not an issue in the Reynolds household. 
everything is auto paid, not, you know, no problem. And so I'm thinking to myself, uh, you know, I run an internet business, the, the, the business pays for the internet. And I'm thinking about the business credit card and the business debit card. I'm like, those are not expired. How could, it, how could the payment have not gone through? What is going on? And so I said, could you give me the last four digits of the credit card number, the card number? And she gave it to me. It's none of my, it's none of my business cards. And then we realized it's my wife's business debit card, which is essentially not used, like blow mm -hmm. the cobwebs off of it, right? She's there in case she has to run to Sam's and get something for the business or something. And even though we got our business debit cards at the same time, somehow our bank, sta I guess they stagger the expiration dates. So hers expired in January of this year. Okay, so her card expires in the auto pay and we don't pay our bill. Did they call us? No, they didn't. No. Did they email us? No, they didn't. Did they reach out to us in any way to let us know that we didn't pay our bill after I had auto paid my Mediacom bill for 20 years? No, they did not. When I talked to the lady, she says, you know, they're not supposed to be cutting off internet right now in the middle of COVID. I'm not sure what went, what's going on. This was a third party that cut off your internet. I said, could I get the name of that third party, please? And she said, well, hold on just a second. She's like, no, they were just responding to an order I said, well, if they're responding to an order, it's a Medicom, it's Medicom's fault. You guys put in the order. She said, no, sir, it's your fault. I said, my fault for what? She said, you didn't pay your bill. Now, listen, I get it. I, maybe I need to take some, per some percentage of the, hey, we had a card expired, right? So they cut off our internet. And of course, I'm like, obviously, just pay it, put it on my, my card, no big deal. Turn the thing back on. No. Well, they are, but Good. they can't do it right away. They got to send somebody out to my house right. to turn it back on. But here's the really shitty part. So I'm like, just pay it, what, what, pay whatever I owe, and then you know, put this one on the auto pay. So you know, she tells me, and I know I'm going to have to pay a disconnect fee and a reconnect fee, and I'm just trying to be cool and not, I'm pissed off about it, but you know. And she's like, okay, and is this the card you want to set up for auto pay? Yes, it is. So all right, the internet will be $179 a month. And I said, whoa, 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 no, no, I'm paying $67 a month. And she said, oh, no, 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 like, once we disconnect your internet, we get to charge you 2.5x. I said, hold on. I've paid my fucking internet every month for 20 years on auto pay. A card expires. You don't call me. You don't email me. You disconnect my internet. And to come back and turn it on, you're going to charge me two and a half times what I was paying? She's like, that's right. Mm -hmm. I go, what is wrong? She, I said, why wouldn't somebody have called me or... Now, actually, I was complaining about the calling and emailing before I knew this was the issue. And she was like, sir, we're not, you know, we're not required to call or email people. Now I know why they didn't call or email me because now they're going to get $170 a month out of me because I don't have any other option for fast internet. So fuck you, Mediacom. But I kept thinking about it. Can you imagine every month we have people's cards bounce at block and they're almost, they're rarely for insufficient funds, right? They're almost always for an expired card or security breach, and we reach out, we send them an email, we're like, hey, you know, we need to update your card, and they almost always update it right away. If they don't update it a couple days, we send them another email, but they always take care of it. Can you imagine somebody that's paying $200, $300 a month, bouncing a card for expired card or security breach, and we're like, thank you for putting your card on file, the charge is now $750 a month, $800 a month for online coaching. The fuck is wrong with people, Scott? Well... They've got to meet their uh, they got to meet their earnings expectations for the oh quarter. My God. It is so infuriating. Listen, if you're a client of ours and you work at Mediacom, either fix this or GTFO. Fuck these people. Or if you know of another gigabit internet service provider I can get in Springfield, Missouri, which you don't because there isn't one, let me know. God damn it, it makes me mad. I need to like report. I don't know if I should report. Can I report them to the governor's office, Better Business Bureau? I guess I like. I don't a, know. That's a monopoly. They're like, listen, you bounced your card. For being expired and we charge you 2.5x that has to be illegal you don't have any other option if i could be like i'll leave you and i'll go here i don't have that option my, oh, my free market I don't have a stroke but 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 my free market go God. build your own internet matt come on man you don't like it you know go 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 make your own isp so frustrating you know all right that's my media com story i hate you media com yeah I hope you but, die yeah, they'll meet they'll meet their earnings expectations. So yeah, of course they will on the back of my two point five x bill. Yeah, fuck these people. That's so good times. Crazy.
they probably okay. like, oh, we're having Go a lot ahead. of. They're like, we're having a lot of cancellations right now. How are we going to make this up on the back end? Because right? when and it gets because when it gets better, you know, there's a bunch of guys with MBAs. Because yeah. when this gets better, when this COVID thing turns around, they're going to come back to us. They have to. Sure. Because right. and there's going to be an influx of people working from home, and they're going to want it upgraded to gigabit. So uh, they're canceling right now. But you know, how are we going to get? My client, my client emailed this. Okay. I think this was just prior to him becoming my client. His name is Matthew, okay. and he says, sore spinal erectors from benching. Recently, when I bench, I have severe cramps in my mid and lower back and have a hard time even sitting up off of the bench. I did 225 for 5x5 five five the other day, and after the last set, I was stuck for a couple of minutes. I have a pretty big arch. The next day, my spinal erectors were sore as hell. I'm 5'10 and 175, 19 years old. Listen, he says he has a pretty big arch. He touches his tailbone to the back of his head. Well, that's, I mean, that's why he's, that's why he's cramping in his abs. Anyway, 175, you're 5'10", Matthew. We, we, he and I have talked about, no, seriously, his arch is ridiculous. Well, that's you, what the problem is then. All right. I could put a basketball under his back yeah, when he that's arches crazy. up. I get it that in some of these federations, you can arch up and you can do that clown show stuff and whatever. Sure. I, I get it. But guys, we're not... We're not doing that. We, you know, we're just we're just trying to get stronger. We need to use that long range of motion. Uh, Matthew has since relaxed that arch some, and it's hard. It's hard. He's really flexy, clearly, and it's really hard for him to get tight with a lower arch. Uh, but as his body weight has gone up and uh, he's gotten more got more muscle around that core, he's he's more able to do that. His bench is strong. Yeah. Yeah. And he, yeah, if you it, think about it, like the, that super arch on the bench press is just like the hardest isometric contraction that you could possibly have in yeah. a, in the sh in the shortest most contracted spot of that muscle like you are contracting your your erectors as hard as you can on a bench press and then holding them in an isometric contraction the entire time so they are as short as you can get an erector and then holding it like that for the entire set well do that to a hamstring see what happens yeah it, 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 it's going to cramp on you and it's going to be sore the next day. And, and you way, certainly can adapt to that over time, but like there's really no reason to have it be that ridiculous. And by the way, I get hamstring cramps when I, when I bench press, you know, you, you oh, bend your knee and you put your heel kind of behind your knee as you lay down and then you're laying out flat. So your hip is fully extended. So your hamstrings are really short and short as uh, they, they can get, they cramp right on up. That's exactly right. Here's another one of my clients. Oh my goodness. Jonathan. Jonathan says, just something I've been pondering about the 48-hour recovery window during LP. Assuming that a novice lifter is eating and sleeping enough, would training every other day on a six-day cycle be beneficial, or is the extra rest day on the seven-day cycle necessary for adequate recovery? I mean, I think our experience is that the seven-day cycle works better for most. If you're somebody that has really good recovery ability, there's no reason why that wouldn't work. If you're a 19-year-old kid, a 21-year-old kid, You've got high testosterone. You can recover quickly. You can eat a bunch of food. Like, there's no reason why that wouldn't work mathematically. Yeah, but for most people, they often will need that extra two days of rest at the end of the week. And I, I think almost anybody could do the every other day thing for quite a while or for a while. Sure. And then they need that extra day. And then later they have to periodize it a little bit when we do the midweek deed load for st That's stuff. Right. And yeah, the answer is it would work great for a little while. But just because our calendar is the way it is and people work five days a week and all that stuff, the three-day-a-week thing still continues to be what I have my folks do. Yep, me too. Every now and then I'll have somebody do that four-day split LP, but mm -hmm. even then I don't like it that much. I have an older guy doing um, one day on, two, day, two days off. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's like, all days are the same. Doesn't matter. Certainly not right now. Yeah. So he's training today, taking two days off, training today, taking two days off, training today, taking Sounds two days great. off. And so that's a, so it works and it's not the same every week, you know, so with that, so one week he'll, he'll train three times and another week he'll train two times and then three times and two times. And it yeah. kind of goes back and forth that way and it works just fine for him. And uh, so, you know, you can play with that, play that game and, and either shorten the entire cycle or lengthen the entire cycle to get the progress you want. It doesn't buy you much, you know? No. It doesn't buy you much. No, it doesn't buy you much. I like the way you think, but for me, it just doesn't get us enough. Nick says, Jim Tunes. Loving the podcast. It's my new favorite, and I've been listening every day for a week now. I want to know what your gym playlist consists of, or even better, is there a public Barbell Logic Spotify playlist floating around? What gets you pumped? I hate this question. 
Yeah, I do I'm too. Sorry, man. I just don't. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah, I don't either. I, I get it. Like I did care. I used to care. Listen, you run a gym for ten years. I don't. I want to listen to bluegrass. I'll listen to like Allison Krauss and Punch Brothers, and I don't because I can't. If I'm hitting a huge PR, maybe I turn. You know, Metallica's bleeding me. I've talked about something like that on, but it's just not. Uh, I'll listen to podcasts when I train. I'll listen to news reports. Mm -hmm. I'll talk to my wife. I'm just too old, and I've done this too long. I don't care. Yeah, I'm not a monkey. I don't like put on music, and my my, my mood changes. You put yeah. on a sad song, and I start crying. You put on another one, I start throwing things. I just rage against the machine. I kick a hole in the wall. You put on another sad song, I start crying. No, I'm not like that. Yeah. Like I'm sufficient in and of myself, and my moods are organic to me. And I, I don't know the music thing just doesn't work. I do have some pod, uh, some playlists on my scotthamburg.com. I've got that the are not they're not the, training playlists. No, they're though, the right? jazz they're, show, the the, so, yeah, yeah. the songs from the jazz show, and some other stuff. Well, but, it's uh, it's interesting though, Scott. If you think about this, that both of us, you and I, are deeply actually affected by music and are like deep lovers of music. It's yep. just not something that I need to get pumped up for lifting anymore. Well, I have to sit down and listen to it if it's going to have some sort of effect. If it's just right. in the background right. or that's whatever, right. it's just yep. I don't know. I think it's I think mostly that's bull. How about that? No, I think it, I think you can use it for some amount of a of sort of adrenaline rush a little bit. But I tell you what, always was weird to me. Uh, it's, there's two parts to this. You know, buddies that I had like in the '90s and early 2000s when you really got like like true ridiculous like death metal came out where they're just like, Bleh! you know, that that's they just growl and vomit into the microphone, and they would listen to that when they're trained. And I'm like, I don't. Like you can f you can hear and feel like a like a you know like the melody of a song or the beat of a song that can that can, that can in fact it's catchy enough to kind of get but there's something about this like this super deep like bass line double bass on the drums and some dude vomiting in the microphone that I'm like what 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 about that hypes right. you up and then here's the extra step to that if you listen to that shit in the car while you're driving down the road you're a psychopath. <laughs> and you should you right. should be institutionalized. And I had friends that did that. I'm like, that's what you listen to in that you listen to like Lamb of God in the car while going shopping at Walmart. Like what? It's so odd. It's so weird. It's so odd. What's wrong with people? I will say certain music can mess me up. I remember one time I was in a public gym and I laid down to bench and like it was something heavy and Desperado came on. I'm like, yeah. no, I'm not going to do this. I was out. Do it. I was in our garage the other day. And I was going to do something. I don't remember what the heck it was, and it was like landslide, like Stevie Nicks. I'm like, yeah. nah, I don't think so. But, uh, I but don't not because you, you were just like pissed off because it's a sad song. Not so much because like you weren't sitting there crying or anything. It wasn't like choking you up. No. Yeah. Because I have had that. You know, like I've had that happen. Eagle, like if the Eagles come on or something, you know, like Des Desperado or something. Because that's my that's the thing that my dad. I listen to my dad. If I'm training, and that stuff pops on. I I lose my shit. And I can't now. I can't train because I'm all choked up about you know that kind of stuff. It's the memories tied to the songs. Man, I'm just deleting questions. There you go. Good. Jacob says, "Can you guys touch more on rest times between sets as we start to make MED changes out of LP? Is it ever valuable to reduce the rest time to create more stress in a shorter period of time, or is that just BS? And the thing to do is always to rest enough until you're ready to go, but not long enough to cool you down." I think I have a very different answer to this question right now. Maybe not. In general, I don't, I very rarely recommend rest period changes for our heavy barbell lifts. I do some, some dynamic work that, you know, we've talked about some West side stuff. You guys can look that stuff up like our West side style stuff. And a lot of times I'll put those on, you know, we'll do six sets of three with 90 to 120 seconds rest, something like that. Like I would do it there. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, I'm not thinking about that's often called density in the strength and conditioning world. Like how much work are we getting done for a per for period set time? And I almost never think about that. Like how much work are they getting done in a specific amount of time? But you know what I am thinking about it? Right now. I got a bunch of people training at home with kettlebells and they don't have heavy barbells. And, and go, go, as go. I add volume to there, I was talking to to a couple guys the other day. As I'm adding volume and stuff, because what else can you add? They have a kettlebell, right. like the intensity set, you know, I just can add like, you know, more work time. Uh, I don't want a kettlebell workout in your living room to last an hour. That's too long. 
And so as I started getting into that stuff, I'm like, oh, 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 we can do more work in the same amount of time. Like I, I want this to be 30, 40 minutes max. So how can we, so I started doing things like supersets with antagonist muscles and things like that to do that. So in, in some of those situations, I would do that. I do that even at home or, or in the gym with normal barbell training with, with accessory movements. A lot of times I put the, I work those superset antagonist muscles or circuits, but I don't think about that as far as work sets of squats, work sets of deadlift. We rest to the typical answer that we give. And I would agree with this is we rest long enough to make sure we hit all of the reps of the next set. That's the point, right? Yeah. I, 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 I tell people when they get started with LP, just wait three minutes and then go. And then later on, go wait five or six minutes and then go. And then, you know, if your LP fizzles out at a given weight with a five-minute rest, well, that's okay. Let's not wait 10 minutes. Let's just yeah, move on. Let's just move on. Um, I'm the same way. So I'll tell people to change their waiting time just because I have them go so short early. Let's, let's just go, 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 go. Yeah. And then later on, they can slow it down a little bit, but not too much. I like that. Uh, Matthew, another Matthew says, your podcast is my favorite, so thank you for what you do. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. He says, my question is, will a hook grip still help my overall strength? I recently got to deadlift 280 for four. I hope that's kilos. And the bar slipped it's out of my, oh, of my, oh, of my double, double overhand. I tried the hook grip today and pulled 285 for five easily. I will continue to use the hook grip going forward, but still warming up the double overhand until my last warm-up set, where I'll slip to the hook grip etc. Yeah. Is there anything else you would suggest to assist the grip strength? No, not really. Although I, I've said this on the podcast before you and I both have, when you switch to the hook grip, I would hook grip every single set for a few weeks just to get used to it. And then once you actually get used to it and you kind of kill those nerves off a little bit and your thumbs, it doesn't hurt so bad anymore. I'd go back to pulling that double overhand for most of your warm ups, and then go to the hook grip. But absolutely if, mm -hmm. if the grip is the limiting factor in a deadlift, you need to figure out a way to be able to hold on to the bar. So hook grip is our always our first choice. Alternating grip is fine, although I'm using it less and less with my clients. And with my older guys, straps are just fine too. You know, I like to work in that grip or double overhand as long as they can and they can't double overhand anymore. Put the straps on. I don't care. You're yeah. 61. You're not gonna you're not gonna compete, and I'm trying to get your back and your hips strong. Oh, gosh. This gentleman uh, says he works for New York State and working for the state sucks. So please leave my name out of the email, out of the question. So we'll do that. Okay. He's okay. a, he's a mid 40s male, weighs 165. He doesn't say how tall he is. That would be crucial for us to know. Because uh, if he's 4'11, he's jacked. Yeah. Yeah. He says uh, he got a, a hairline fracture in the tibial plateau. Ugh. Um, and he says he was squatting 250, deadlift in 300, and so on. He says, the doctor never took me out of work, but wants me to wear a knee, a knee immobilizer and be on crutches, knowing I have a very active career that requires me to walk, run, and or jump in rural or urban environments with a dog on my side. Okay. When I wear the brace, my knee hurts. When I walk without wearing the brace, it feels a lot better. So my thought is bones under pressure go quicker than, the, than, rest, than resting them. Um. He said he's still been doing upper body LP. Have you guys ever worked with someone who had this type of injury? Should I or can I do squats or deadlifts? Yes. No, generally, yes. You specifically? I don't know. I'm not a doctor. Right. <laughs> there's, my, there's my CYA. Yeah, man, I think you're thinking the right, the right direction. I'm not going to tell you to squat or deadlift or to run or not wear your knee brace, but I think in general that is the, the common thought process at this point. You probably have an older doctor who wants to just really let the thing heal. Of course, the real problem here is, again, we won't call out his occupation, even though we all know what his occupation is, is that he's being forced to run, which is why he has the stress fracture in the tibial plateau. He didn't get it from squats and deadlifts. He got it from running Jarring to, meet his, to meet his physical fitness test that he has to do for his job, which is stupid. But he can't fix that. That's the rule. So you got to do what you got to do. So... Definitely don't run right now. Let the thing heal. And then here, here's what I found. You are very probably a heel runner. You're running on your heels. And there's no, like, we've got that pad on the ball of our foot for a reason. That ankle is supposed to be able to take some of that force, and it's supposed to be able to, to spread it out over the, entire, over the entire foot. If you bounce on your heels then your shins are going to take all of that compressive force over and over and over and over again, 
which is not that bad when you're 165. It's much worse when you're 265. But um, so don't run. And then when you have to get back to doing it, learn how to do a little more, a little more heel, like toe to heel to toe, heel to toe. Don't just slam on your heels. This gentleman may not be able to pick and choose when he runs. No, that's in, true. In which Although case I would assume in the process of having a stress fracture, if the doctors put him in on, on a, a brace that immobilizes the knee, then he probably gets out of running for a while. That'd Maybe. be my guess. Oh, I see what you're saying. In an actual work situ- scenario, right. not in a training scenario, but in a... If yeah, it's time I, to run when you're at work and you got to, I hope you, you can to. run. A guy here, listen to this. Are you sitting down? I am. Dominic says, I'm 37 years old, 245 pounds, six foot one, homeschooling father of 10. Geesh. He I don't said, know if I should congratulate him or be terrified. He's doing he's doing the good work, man. He's got a home Gracious. gym. His one rep max press is 85 kilos. Okay, pretty strong. There pretty we strong. Go. We got a strong guy. Bench press, 140. Wow. Squat, 5 RM at 140. Mm-hmm. Okay. He, he gives me a belt squat one. I don't give a shit. Five rep max uh, deadlift at is also 140. Weird. So here's the opposite issue, right? Here's the guy who's super strong in the upper body yeah, and not that strong in the lower body. So, okay. Yeah. He says he's in LP. He says, how long should I expect to run LP as it is? No idea. By the way, let me tell you who is strong with their lower body. This guy's wife. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. She might be able to, she might be able to squat and deadlift more than he can. Well, she She's got some an- birth and hips. Maybe. Can I forego power cleans? Yes. Yes. Should I substitute substitute log cleans? No. No. You, d- dude, you're... Uh, you need to get your squat and deadlift strong. That's what you need to do. Right. Whatever you're doing on bench press and press is working. Keep doing that. Don't really change anything or make one small minimum effective dose change at a time on upper body. And you probably, probably need a little more stress on the lower body. I don't know you. Maybe you're overstressed, but you're probably not. It's not that heavy. It's not not as far as training stress. Training, you need some training stress. That's right. Mm -hmm. So you might need a little more volume. You might need a little more frequency. Maybe you're, you know, maybe you're not pushing the weights up very high. Maybe you do some more triples and doubles and singles to get heavier weight on your back and in your hands. These questions keep getting crazier, which I enjoy. My goals are not for a huge bench press, but rather a one and a half times body weight overhead press. Can I replace bench with another press day or close grip bench? Dude, you can do anything you want, but I wouldn't screw with that. Yeah. It's do them both. Good. They help each when other. I, if you, you know, I just, obviously, man, we, we'd have to see your programming. There are lots of people that I program five presses a week for. So they do, it's an upper lower split, split, but on one of the lower days, they do one extra press or bench press, depending on what they're focused on. And if they're a power lifter, they're going to bench press or variant three times a week. They're going to press twice a week. You could probably do that, but press-ish three times a week and then bench a couple times a week. But mostly what I would do is I'd get your squat and deadlift up. Get your squat and deadlift up and just bench and bench and press, man. I mean, you're going to one rep max of like 187 and that's not that heavy. Come on, just bench and press. It'll, it's fine. You're, you're overcomplicating this. He actually says, I started and stopped LP several times having been lured by fancy programs and studies like the Schoenfield volume study. Well, fucking knock it off, man. Just do the stuff. It's, it's weird to see those guys like Brad Schoenfeld. It was, you know, back in the olden days, in the late 90s, all, all of us were in the, on this, there were like four forums and we were all on them and we would argue, you know, like him and, and Lyle McDonald and, you know, Glenn Penley, God rest his soul. And people like, well, we were all on the same forum. It's always, it's funny to me. I, I, I know these stories about these guys who have now gone on to have really, like really nice careers in this stuff. And I, I certainly as I have, and they probably have the same stories about me. And I can remember like funny stories about them from like 99 when they were just a kid and mm-hmm. didn't know what the hell they were doing. And then it's always like, Oh, these guys have these programs and stuff that they sell now. And ugh. so anyway, good dude, by the way, Brad Schoenfeld. Great guy, actually. Nice guy. Uh, you probably don't need his program. So, and then he says, well, excess body fat supply for calories during caloric restriction as long as protein and carbs are high enough to fuel training. Maybe. Yeah. If maybe. real fat, they will. Yeah, 245 <laughs> and 6'1". Maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Especially as strong as you are. If you had numbers, man, that were like, especially your upper body, if it was, you know, 40% weaker then I might say at 245 and 6'1", like, yeah, you probably got enough fat on you because I, you can tell by how weak he is. Right. 
a dude as strong as you are at 245 and 6'1", you probably don't have enough body fat to really use there. Like, that doesn't mean that you're at... You, you know, can get leaner eventually, but... Sure. That's... It's probably not time. Right. It says, why is behind the neck press not utilized? I have the shoulder mobility and think having a strong upper back is desirable. Pushing a van up an icy hill uh, or something like that would use the behind the neck sort of motion, he says. I would push a van up a... Like backwards? Dude, you're not going to push them with your triceps... If I were going to push a van up an icy hill, I would face the van. Yeah. So, well, listen, let's talk uh, about this. The pre- Go ahead. No. Right, well, let's talk about that damn thing. Like, <laughs> if you're going to be se- seated, the bar in the center of gravity is going to be right over the middle of your pelvis where your butt touches the, the bench. If you're standing, it's going to be uh, right over the midfoot. And whether you do it in front of your face or behind your face, the bar path is essentially going to be the same. Yep. You're... You're going to you're going to dip your head forward to get it behind your head. It's going to stay over your midfoot. The bar, the muscles it uses are going to be very slightly different. And well, it's actually going to be different muscles. You're going to use them in a slightly different percentage relative to each other over the bottom six inches of the range of motion. Yep. Everything else is absolutely identical. The behind the neck press is ninety nine percent absolutely stupid. Well, here's why it's stupid. It's it's not. So he's Scott's right that it's got, it would build identical strength to the in front of the face neck press in front of the neck press. The potential danger there is actually that your elbows and your humerus is more. They're more abducted and there's more internal rotation, and so that yeah, shoulder creates. Impingement. That's right. It it dramatically increases the percentage chance that you impinge something in the sub- subacromial space, right? There's lots of stuff that can get impinged and you can get lots of stuff. In- so so it is way safer without any, uh, without any decrease in benefit to strength to be able to press in front of the neck. Here's why people want to press behind the neck, Scott, a lot of times is... Because they watch Pumping Iron? Yeah, and they that's right. It's an old school lift and you can throw the weight really easy. I, I behind the neck push pressed... 405 easy many 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 times because you can put it on your back and you can throw the weight and it's it's a push press right right um if you actually want to do strict behind the neck press it just puts your shoulder in a bad position that's all there is to it and doesn't make you any stronger so and i don't know any sports that test for it right are there any of those old like odd implement strong i don't not that i know of i've never heard i mean there might be but I just, there's no reason for it. You know, if yeah. you're like, hey, I need to get stronger at log because I'm competing at strongman, like, it makes sense. So if you're like, hey, I'm going to do this competition that has been behind the neck press, we can talk about it, but I don't just, know if anybody does do that. Just do the four big lifts, man. Just do the big four big lifts. Yeah. And focus on the squat and deadlift because you're, you're not that strong on those. Yeah. Uh, Seth says, deadlift questions. Fairly new to this podcast, but I'm loving it. I commute quite a bit for work. Not no more. <laughs> no. He says, I'm 30 years right. old, six foot tall, and I've gone from 140 to 195. That is wonderful. That's awesome. He says, my grip is now failing at the in the deadlift. To what degree are lifting strategies acceptable? We've already talked about this, but let's How do it anyway. He? What do you say? He says he's 30. Yeah, I mean, man, you're you're probably too young to use lifting straps unless you're, you know, unless you're doing lots of high volume lifts. And then I would high volume pulls, I would have young guys do straps. So it just gets if you start doing like sets of sets of five and six or or six or five or six sets, either one. Lots of volume. Uh, I would have you use straps, but for a thirty-year-old guy, I'd learn how to hook grip. Yep. Or I would learn how to alternate grip as a. I would hook grip if I could. He says we've got lots of stuff on that. Are they a better or worse option than using the switch grip? The hook grip is. Oh, our straps. We're straps. Yeah. Uh, I say. Uh, I say they are a better option if you're pulling over five hundred. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I, I've never heard of anybody tearing a bicep with you know three fifteen. I'm sure it's happened. You, um, it is a, but at they 500, are a, that they're a better issue. option for speed work. They're a better option for rack pulls. Um, and then Strap for up. safe, for safety's sake, yeah. not for safety's sake, but just for the amount of work you have to do. If you're doing a bunch of RDLs or something like that, uh, I, I would use those, those straps, but, uh, yep. agreed. Yeah. Don't overthink it. In a deadlift set of five, how much time is allowable for brief grip rest between reps? None. Zero. That's, that's legitimately like two seconds. No, you can't turn loose of the bar. You can't turn loose. You should never turn loose of the bar, including with a hook grip. Yep. A hook grip is set. It stays set for all five reps, right? Dude, 
If you, you have one breath grip. at the bottom, that's what you're allowed. One breath that you go down, you put the bar down, you breathe out, you breathe in, you squeeze up, you pull. If you hook grip and you turn and it, you know, it's heavy and it hurts and you turn loose, the blood will rush back into that thumb and it will hurt it's way worse. worse. That's Just exactly right. Keep it going until you're done. Well, and it's it's actually the same thing with the other stuff. Like it never gets better. Like, oh, I'll just rest an extra two or three seconds down here. No. For those of you guys that have done that, you know that doesn't that's not better. You actually your body is continuing to to utilize oxygen and you're just becoming hypoxic. You're just getting down there and running out of oxygen. Yeah. Get the set over with. A set of heavy deadlifts, a set of five deadlifts, and that should take like 20 seconds, 30 seconds max. I get people send me videos, it's a minute 15. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, yeah, we it's horrible. Can speed this thing up. If you told if you programmed like a minute and fifteen worth of deadlifts for me. Can you imagine? I'd never talk quit. to you again. Yeah. You wouldn't just you just wouldn't quit as a client. You quit as a coach. You're like, I won't yeah. even work for you I'm, anymore. I'm not talking so to you anymore. I'm completely out of this. I'm getting out of the industry. He <laughs> says I'm not the podcast. My double overhand grip does not allow for touch and go reps. Good. Don't touch and go. We pull your rep. Touch and grow. Reset. Pull another one. He says, Is there any benefit or reason for wearing lifting shoes during the deadlift as opposed to wearing socks? Sure. Yeah. Sanitation, safety. You're not pulling heavy anyway. What do you care? You're what solid do you think on of that? the floor. We, I mean, we like, you know, we've talked about this. We like, guys are real strong. If they want to pull in socks, I pull in my socks. There's nothing wrong with that at all. It, Shoes, every every PR I've pulled in the last three years has been in, in, in shoes. shoes. Yeah. And you're long-legged. Yeah. And your legs get a little longer. Yeah, there's benefits to pulling in shoes. Yes. Stability, shin angle, it's easier to push through your midfoot, all that sort of stuff. You know, I got some, we got some uh, uh, YouTube comments the other day about, yeah. Texas method in particular, and 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 we I get these are I get these comments frequently, and the comment goes something like this: "What you recommended is garbage because elite athletes don't do it." Right. I actually like those comments. I don't mind those at all. Uh, why? I know. Why would you like that? I'm just. First off, if you post a YouTube comment, you're worse than the people that run MediaCom. You're worse. Are you you worse than the people that run YouTube? on YouTube, which is Google. That's, that's uh, pretty tough. Yeah, so in case you guys haven't figured this out yet, uh, we don't care about we don't care about high-level athletes here. Well, There are lots of places that have that. High-level athletes were once novices or early intermediates. Right. And uh, Texas Method is for people who just left the novice phase. They're not for advanced or that's elite right. athletes. And just because you saw an elite athlete pull in flats doesn't mean you should. That's right. uh, by the way, KK would pull in combat boots. Right. Who sure. cares? So I, if you're one of those people, like, oh, there's elite athletes, and then, you know, we, we're not talking about that. We almost never talk about that. Well, the, the argument, it, it's just, it's so deeply ingrained in culture where people look at the best of whatever sport, and they're like, whatever they do, I'm going to do. And they forget... Right. Like, whatever Michael Jordan does from basketball, that's what I'm going to do. That way I can be like Michael Jordan, except you forgot. You're not Michael Jordan. You'll never be like Michael Jordan. Well, what if Michael Jordan wrote a book about what he did from ages 4 to 10 as he learned to play basketball? It'd that be more could practical, be useful. That could but I be still useful. don't think it works. And this is why yeah. it doesn't work. I mean, like, yes, you can't it, jump. That, that makes practical sense. But here's what we know. Freaky athletes... All the freaky athletes are in Division One sports, and they're all doing the dumbest strength and conditioning program of all time, and they all get strong. They all clean 400 pounds. They're all strong as fuck, and that's because they're freaky athletes. It has nothing to do with their program. Yeah. No, we, we train normal people here. Here, middle of the bell curve, left of the bell curve. Like, that's who we train. That's what we're doing. And, and, and would Texas Method work for... What the point you're making is Texas Method will work wonderfully for elite athletes after they're out of the novice phase. The problem with with the elite athletes is almost anything works for those people. It actually does. They actually, you know, like they don't have to do that at all. Yeah. But for the rest of us, we have to make that step by step progression. And so, yeah. So people come in, they're like, "Oh, you're you're not doing this. You're not doing DUP. You're not doing um. What's the one? What's the damn it? What's the uh, Shiko? You're not doing Shiko." Shiko. Like, it's not. No, you're it's right. A, it's a 46 year old soccer mom who just got out of LP. Here, De- why would they do that? Coaching family members. Devin says, "Thanks for what you're doing." 
he found out about barbell training years ago through Art of Manliness, and it changed my life, he says. He says go. he's currently getting a master's degree in kinesiology. I don't know why the fuck you would do that. He says, but I've been able to get several members into barbell training, including my mother, and she's doing great because of it. Over Christmas, I was talking to my sister, and I made the case for strength training. She is really stubborn, bless her heart, and she refuses to do barbell training. She still wants my help getting in shape and losing weight, but I'm at a loss for a second best option. Do not compromise. Tell her to do what you tell her or go talk to her old man about it. This is his mom or his mother-in-law? This is his sister. Oh, I missed it. Sorry. His mother His mother is training and doing well. And oh, yeah, yeah. His sister uh, is okay, sorry. a recalcitrant. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. It is what it is, right? So some people don't listen. If your sister doesn't respect you and she's not going to do the thing, she's not going to do the thing. Uh, if she really wants to work out, there is a way to, to sort of trick her into this. Like you can actually do... You can teach her, I mean, if she's out of shape, she's never done this before, you might just teach her how to squat by standing up correctly out of a chair for a while and then hand her a kettlebell or dumbbells or a goblet squat and make her a little stronger. And then eventually she's going to run out of things she can hold on to to goblet squat. And you'll be like, you know what's working? Barbell on your back. But man, ultimately, you can't, you can't train people who run. This is, remember, we've talked about this. This external motivation doesn't work for this thing long term. Yeah. Uh, you, you know white knuckle discipline doesn't work long term for this thing. If you're not after the first three or four weeks, if you're not deeply internally motivated to do this, you're not going to do it deeply. Speaking of. Yes, sir. Seminar group number one, the first people who signed up at online great books. Yes. Are now in their fourth month of Aristotle. Okay. And they're reading Aristotle's metaphysics and they did their first seminar and, uh, our, our friend Kirk is one of those guys. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Tall Kirk. K Tall Kirk. There's a guy, Chris, I think he's a Barbell Logic client. Yep. Uh, sure. we, we know, you know some of these guys, actually. And they're just having a terrible time with it. It's it hard, is, man. It is one of the hardest How long metaphysicists. Does it last? What's the end? What do you mean? Like, how, how long are you in Aristotle doing this thing? Uh, they're going to read about... Ten months worth, but oh, they're God. right now they're four reading, months in. Yeah, and they're and they're <laughs> so reading. They got six months to go. <laughs> well, but they're in the worst of it. The met metaphysics right, right. is a weird thing. It's about it's about what it is to be, <laughs> right? What it be to is like what 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 something. <sighs> how do you know things exist? What is existence? All it's it's, it's hard to talk about. And it's hard to read about, and they're really really struggling. And I talked to them. Uh, I just had a Zoom with them about it, and um, you know I can't externally motivate them to do it, and it's sure. so hard. Like you can spend hours and hours and hours reading that and contemplating it, and be completely at sea. Like understand none of it, right? Feel dumb, not see the end, and it just takes an enormous amount of grit to persevere in that state of confusion when you believe that you should be understanding it, that it should be getting clearer, and it's just not. And they just have to, I can't give it to them. I just told them, I was like, guys, you've got to have your own internal motivation to be bettered by this. Yeah. Because I, it's not, it's not easy. You know, we don't give it to them until month 29. They've been doing it over two years, you sure. know? But it's the beginning of, I mean, it's the beginning of, big kids philosophy. Yeah. And they, and once they do that, they can do anything. I was going to say it actually gets significantly easier. Yeah. There's some bad the shit out there. Stuff. It's, it's pretty hard. There's some German idealists and some, but Descartes oh, right. and some bad shit, but, uh, but I can't do it for them. And they're going to have to find an internal motivation and a sort of internal quietude that will let them be completely lost in the thing. Um, for as long as it takes to get out of that maze. And it's going to be really hard for them. And if you've got uh, uh, someone who's overweight, they don't feel good about being overweight. Nobody feels good about being overweight. Uh, if they don't believe there's an end in sight for getting rid of that weight while lifting weights, if they don't understand it, they're just going by what you tell them and they don't, they don't have all of that knowledge for themselves. They haven't thought it all the way through like you. Uh, they'll either trust you and go with it and grit it out based on their faith in your reason, or they're not going to do it. Yep. 
And if she does it, she'll do it for a while out of a courtesy to you. And if you're just lucky enough that she sees some results before she gives up on that willingness to be courteous to you, you might keep her. But otherwise, yep. you won't. And the chances are you won't because it's too freaking hard. <sighs> All good points. Good. That is another Barbell Logic podcast. Um, you can go to iTunes and listen to the, or uh, leave us a review. Uh, send a link to it to somebody else. That would be good. That would be good if you re- referred it out. And send us some more questions. Send us some questions to questions at barbell-logic.com. And listen, a lot of you cats have uh, have listened to all of these shows. And you've heard all of the questions we've had. If you have a question that you have not heard us answer on this, that is not absurd, we would like to, for you to send that in. Definitely. Yes. And... There was some noise on Slack the other day about some people wanted me to just be unhinged on the show one time. <laughs> that is true. And listen, I, I, I don't do that here. I, I don't do that here. That's not. This is not the proper venue, guys. Is there a proper venue? Um, if I ever invite you to my house, it'll be unhinged. No, that's where I'm actually hinged. Right, like right now, I'm all uncoupled and I'm just all out of sorts and I just can't be myself. But you get authentic Hamburg at your house. That's right. But if you want something that's a little closer, catch one of my Instagram lives. Or you can go to uh, scotthamburg.com and see that stuff there. Because uh, What the, about the, the other podcasts you do? Are, do you, are you ever a little more, like, hamburg I mean, I'm always me. I know, but I'm always like, you can't, or I'll, you'll say something sometimes. I'm like, Trent, you got to cut that out of the podcast. But... You don't do that on your stuff. So on like the Scott stream stuff, are you a little more like in your face about it? Yeah. It's a little less. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. So there's. Yeah. I've got one. Like, I think the title of it is like Paul Krugman's or, <laughs> or something like that. But he is. And uh, yeah. So th- that stuff's out there. That stuff's out there. Yeah. There you go. So yeah. Unhinged. Unhinged Hamburg is. Well, I always like it. Like people that I meet that know you, they're out. That's always the first thing they say, you know, like you're like you're like my eye doctor that's your wife's cousin. And he was like, hmm, he's got some crazy ideas. <laughs> that's like the first thing he said. He could, that's right. That's my ch- eye doctor. That's Charity's cousin, Corey. He's such a boring normie. He's like, <laughs> get a 30-year mortgage, buy the ha- biggest house you can afford. You know, just sure. like, oh, come on, man. Good looking man, though. Very attractive dude. Huh, you like that? I mean. I'll let him know. Not, I mean, not sexually or anything, but like I can look at that guy and be like, I can be confident enough in my manhood to say, that's a good looking man. Good. I don't mind him checking my eyes. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys for listening. Hey, go buy a bidet at hellotushy.com. Like, clean, get your butthole clean. You don't need the toilet paper then. Stop going like all the rest of these morons to, to Sam's and Costco and trying to buy all this toilet paper. You don't need toilet paper if you got a Hello Tushy bidet. Use discount code LOGIC to get that butthole clean. By the way, they have, a sh- they have shirts, Scott, this, that I don't know if you've seen them that say, Ask me about my butthole. I have not and, seen those. And, and I'm going to, I can't wait to wear that. One. When they open up the world again, I already told my daughters, I've got that shirt and I'm going to wear that shirt around town that says, Ask Me About My Butthole. All right. Send your questions to questions at barbell-logic.com and we will talk to you guys in a few days. 